We have compassion on others, others who go through the valley of the shadow of death. When we pray, 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 none of those things will ever, ever happen to me. Why? Why would God allow his people to suffer? Why would a good and righteous God allow innocent people, innocent quotes, to suffer? See, we totally understand how the wicked suffer. The biblical principle. You reap what you so. sow. But for you and I, the faithful of God, how is it possible for us to experience great sorrow and pain? Now we can understand a little suffering, but a grandchild dying. Our spirit cries out, wait a minute, God, I didn't sign up for this one. Right? Be honest. The book of Job is the earliest of the books we have in the Bible. It's even studied by unsaved people. I've heard unsaved, even atheists, debate this book. And it's because, generally, the question it's dealing with is why do good people suffer? And even atheists don't know that. And they'll go to this book and study it. There are many approaches to take tonight, but our goal has been to look at the big picture so I don't have a sheet of paper on you. I wouldn't even come in. I had that lunch or something like that. But if you wanted to take notes, the first one is the Almighty King. Just the characters in the storyline. First we see the Almighty King. Chapter 1, verse 6. Now there was a day the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan came also among them. Let's look at that verse I say this. We immediately notice the angels coming to the Almighty King as in a kingdom. Look at it. They came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan came also among them. This King is the one who made all things. He's the Creator. He's the Ruler. Everyone else is under Him. They come with great respect. If we were to enter into the presence of a King tonight, wouldn't we just start talking and mouthing off? And... No, we would do what? Silence. Exactly what's going on in this passage. No one speaks. The first one to speak is who? Verse 7. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, Now he's permitted to speak. We're going to and fro to the earth, walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth. Perfect and upright man, one that feareth God, steweth or hated evil. Who's in control here? Who's over Satan? Question. Who brings up Job to Satan? Who's the pastor? Who brings up Job to Satan? You know, sometimes we can act as a state that has a lot of power, and it almost as much as the Almighty, and I hear people speak that way, and sinful thinking, God is the one setting this whole thing up. Just like last week in Esther, what did God allow to happen? He allowed Mordecai to do what? He allowed a queen to what? Rebel, right? He allows Mordecai to have maybe a proud spirit say, I refuse to bow my head before that man. And all of a sudden, millions of Jews are about to die because of it. God sets up the whole scene, folks. He's in control. And he uses the sinfulness of man. Here he's going to use the sinfulness of Satan for his glory. God is placing, I like Mark Devers said it this way, God is placing Job's life on a mousetrap as a piece of cheese. Just think about that. God, if he is, when you look at it, think about what he's saying. God is placing Job's life on a mousetrap as a piece of cheese, and Satan is not able to resist taking the bait. He's God. He knows Satan. He created him. Let's not be mistaken here. God is offering Job to Satan. Very important to get that. This whole book, verse 8. And the Lord said to Satan, Is thou considered a servant of Job? I'm dangling him to you. Does this disturb us about God? 
Bible reader says this, God points Job out to Satan. Satan reacts in character as the adversary of God and his people. Most commentators correctly conclude that God is the real initiator of Job's test. Yet while Satan uses and discards human beings in a casual, cruel manner, God does not. The reason, this is very important what I'm about to say, but we'll hit on it later. The reason then for Job's suffering is found in God's character rather than Satan. Put a little too much emphasis on Satan in this passage. Put all the emphasis where it needs to be. Because after chapter 2, we don't read of Satan anymore. The rest of the book's all talking about God. Confuse friends about God and Job's correct view about God. It's all about God. The entire book is. Why this happened? Well, where's we said? Had Job known about this conversation between Satan and God, he would have had no room for doubt or was concerned. He would have known that God was using him as a weapon to refute Satan's lies. But he did not know what was happening in the councils of heaven. Therefore, Job had to take his trials by faith. We don't know of Job knowing this whole scene at all was reading chapter 1 and 2. He doesn't know it. But by the end of this message, I hope you would know God a little deeper. So as God places Job on the trap, number two, if you're taking notes, we see a defeated devil responds. A defeated devil responds. He's already defeated. Verse 9. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Let Job fear God for naught. Hast not thou a hedge about him, about his house, and about all that he hath on his side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance and the increase of the land. Notice the wording. Satan knows what's going on. But put forth thy hand now, God. Touch all that he hath, and even curse him for thy faith. The Lord said unto Satan, Total control. Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself, but not thy hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. As you read, it's apparent Satan can do nothing unless permitted by his almighty God. Yes, God is his God. He bows before him. All do. Satan's power only comes based on what God permits. We see a lot of evil happening in our neighborhood. It's not that Satan is all powerful to do as he pleases. Please understand that. It, it is God permitting it in his timing. Satan would like to devastate all of God's creation if he had the power to do so. But the Lord's in control and it's over all for his glory. Satan would love to destroy us all. That's very clear in scripture. But folks, he's more like a lion on a chain that can only devour what God allows. God's the one holding the chain. He's the one who permits it to go out and brings it back. You want to use that knowledge, you know. In this whole passage, make sure we dwell on God and not Satan when bad things happen to us. And Satan gets more attention than he deserves. Knowing Satan is evil and does evil is one thing, but dwelling on Satan will not help us become more like Christ. For to dwell on Satan place our minds on the wrong person. Just wait, you'll see how Job responds to all this. He responded correctly. Let's continue verse 9 again. And Satan answered the Lord and said, The Job feared God for all. Well, where's we said? Satan's accusation against Job was really an attack on God. That little phrase there, he, he rephrases it. He says, Satan was basically saying, The only reason Job fears you is because you Pay him to do it. You two have made a contract. You protect him, prosper him, as long as he obeys you and worships you. You are not a God worthy of worship. You have to pay people to honor you. Who's ever read screw tape letters? Okay. That's exactly Satan's warped. You know, his sin, he's warped. In, in, in screw tape letters, it's the one demon talking to the other demon and says, God really doesn't love these people. He has another ulterior motive. We just haven't figured it out yet. Our department of demons is trying to work with it and figure out what he's doing. He doesn't really love these humans. You know? I love it. I encourage you to read it. That's what Satan's warped. In 
this passage, this whole passage, God is declaring Job is righteous, God for a man. Satan declares Job worships God for the benefits. Doesn't that happen though in our churches? Doesn't that truly happen now? Yes. Why do you bring your children to church? Most people, they don't go to church, they have children, and guess what they want to start doing? They want to go to church. And then when their children grow up, what do they stop doing? Going to church. They stop going to church. What was the purpose of church? <laughs> well, I'll meet somebody nice, you know, or whatever, you know. Just put good things in their life. They're missing the big picture. They don't even know who God is, if that's what they think. Verse 10 and 11, when he says, verse 10, Satan speaking to God, you place this hedge around him, you bless him. And verse 11, put forth thy hand now and touch all that he hath, and curse thee to thy face. Who gave Job all things? God. God. Who could take away all things from Job? God. Now we know the whole big picture. Was Job serving God for the money? No. No. Verse 12, though. The Lord said to Satan, all that he had is in thy power now. But make sure you don't touch his life. Who's in control in this passage? God. God. God's in control. Third, we see a grace-filled Job. Look at how, what happens to Job, verse 15. I'm not reading all of it. Sabians fell down and took them away of his slain servants. Verse 16. While he was yet speaking, this man came. Fire of God fell from heaven, burned up the sheep, servants. Verse 17. While he was speaking, the Chaldeans made out three bands fell upon the camels and all the slain people. Verse 18. While he was speaking, came another, my sons and daughters were eating and drinking. Verse 19. Great wind came, fell, all were dead. Folks, how does a grace filled person respond to all this? Verse 20. Read verse 20 to 22 out loud with me, please. Then Job arose and rent his mantle, and shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground, and worshipped, and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord had taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. For all this Job sinned not, or charged God with foolishness. You need to think about something. Very important. <coughs> Does Job focus on the Sabaeans, the fire, the Chaldeans, and the great wind that destroyed everything he has? No. Does he? And is Job filled with hate toward all those people and Mother Nature? No. Does Job cry out, Why me? Of all the people on earth, why me? Is that what you hear? Job knows his almighty God, and he knows that he knows all things come from God. He doesn't blame anybody. I would. Would you, Albert? Would you, Micah? Grace filled Job. I think he had to be grace filled to do this. Job doesn't focus on the circumstance and bear karma, or it just happens to be a bad day. Job doesn't focus on the conspiracy theory. Everyone must be against me. Job doesn't even focus on how much he hates all those people who are hurting. Who is Job focusing on? God. Because of what happened to Job, his words are more powerful as it read in verse 21 at the end. The Lord gave and the Lord taketh away. Bless his name. Folks, this is not possible. I'll be honest with you, it's not. God's grace had to be upon him at this moment. God's grace had to sustain him. Remember, this is a test for Job, but it's showing us bad things do happen to righteous people. Bad things do happen to righteous people. Is that okay with us? Don't answer. If it's not, why not? We are not in a perfect place yet. We are sinners. We will still experience this sinful world. That means people we love will die. Our bodies will break down and hurt. We 
we will feel pain, pain of sin. This is why Paul speaks of our bodies groaning to be redeemed. He feels the pain of all of us. You know, the slashes on his back and all. But our hearts are still in rebellion toward God in so many ways. We're not perfect yet. We're not perfected. So now in chapter 2, God and Satan have another conversation. What does Job get out of all this? Verse 7. So when Satan forth from the presence of the Lord, and smote Job with the sword, boils from the sole of his foot to his head, he took a pot share and began to scrape those boils. His wife was the wisest of them all, right? Verse 9, she says to him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. And he said to her, Thou speakest one of the foolish women speaking. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? Shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. Did Job take more? And the answer is only by God's mercy and grace. We are all feeble, aren't we? Well, we've got to remember that Job is focused on his God before anything bad happened. Isn't that kind of important? See, if you're going down the road and everything's about you, and you're not dwelling on God deeply, when bad things happen, how do you do? Just be honest, how do you do? We don't do so well, do we? Job was prospering, and he was still worshiping God. Now, how many people really do that in our day? Usually people prosper, they want to really get to know God because God may ask for some of their money. You know, you know God gave it all to them in the first place. Right? That's how people think. Very simply, we're really good at that. And none of us will ever experience the pain that Job went through but we can be like Job and draw closer to our God. You've got to take that time to do it. I hope you see that by the end of the message. Mark Dever speaks of this. He says, our lives are about something greater than ourselves. We think our suffering is all about us and our families, but it's not. God can and will continue to do things solely to bring Him glory, and He's right to do so. So as we look at this book, we must focus on Job's situation, and we start to think, what is God doing? The fact is, God never explains Himself to Job. He never says why. Job never knows why he suffers. I'm going to say something very powerful. Job doesn't have a right to know. Nor do we. Does that like get a rebellious spirit up? When I say that? I don't deserve to know. Nor do you. Who's the creator? Who's the creature? Let's, let's just put this in balance here. And folks, we are blessed because all that God has done for us, and we haven't deserved any of it. God made the world, and everyone who lives in it, we know that. Where did God have him be born? In America. Not a war-torn country. Just think about this. Is God still good and right to have billions of others being born in deep poverty and even kill his infants? Is God still good and righteous? And before you answer with a sinful heart, you better draw closer to God. For even as Job says in chapter 2, verse 10 in the middle, he speaks to his wife. Shall we receive good at the hand of God? Shall we not receive evil? Another answer is, we're supposed to receive what? Both. Both. It's fine. Job knows his God good enough. I will accept both. He has no other choice, does he? What is he going to do? Be bitter and kill himself? That's chapter 3. We see that. Folks, Job knows exactly who ordered this misery, and yet he still worships God. That's amazing. There comes a change in chapter 3. At the end of chapter 2, Job's three friends, they kind of show up. They sit in silence for seven days. We're not going to read it. Verse 12, sit in total silence for seven days. And then Job speaks up and says something. Verse 1 of chapter 3. After this, over Job's mouth, cursed the day. Now he's cursing something. Does he curse God? Curses the day, though, doesn't he? 
Joe Spanky said, let the day perish where I was born in the night in which it was said there was a man child conceived. Let the day be darkness. Let not God regard the love from above. Neither let the light shine upon me. Goes through speaking, wishing God didn't allow him to be born. Job is in depression. He knows God is sovereign over all. I'm about to say something else that's going to shock you a little bit. Knowing that God is sovereign did not help Job. It made it worse. Because he can't figure him out. He can't figure God out. Why is God doing this? Does that make sense to you? Not, what do I mean? If you're an atheist, you just bank it on bad luck or karma if you're an atheist. But Job knows God is over all this. He doesn't blame like Satan. He doesn't blame like the Sabians or the Chaldeans or the wind. He just says, God did this to me. That's it. I know he did it to me. And I'm still blessed and I'm still praising him. Seven days later, as he's mauling in his mind for seven days in depression, saying absolutely nothing, then he goes, I wish I'd never been born. He's in depression now. He's in depression. But even though Job longs for death, he doesn't commit suicide, does he? Yeah. He doesn't even forsake his God. In chapter 13, listen to his words. In depression, he says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. And I will maintain my own ways before him. He also shall be my salvation. He's going to come through. I know. In that passage here, he's on my left hand. I don't see him. He's on my right hand. I don't see him. He's behind me. I don't know where he is, but you know what? He knows where I am. I'm going to trust this God. Though he does this. That's powerful, isn't it? That's what we need to get from this. He's totally just laying himself on God. What other thing would Job do? Worry? Talk about it for the next 50 years? Most people do. Doesn't help them, does it? Job deals with this. And yes, he's in depression. Absolutely he's in depression. But yet he still trusts his God through the depression. I think that's very key. Now most of this book is about three friends. Now, these friends... What do they do to them? You know the passage well. No, what do they do? Turn off pretty good. They up pretty bad. And what's the whole point of the friends? What's the whole point of the friends saying? You remember? What's the whole point? Yeah, there's a hidden sin somewhere, Joe, in your life. And that's why I say a confused friend. Look at chapter 4. The next chapter over, the first time. The person speaks in Eliphaz, look at verse 3. He speaks about Job in verse 3. So look what he says about Job. Yo, thou hast instructed many, thou hast strengthened the weak hands, thy words have upholden that are falling, thou hast falling, and thou hast strengthened the feeble knees. But now, it's changing now, it has come upon thee, and thou canest. It touches thee, and thou art troubled. Is not this thy fear, thy confidence, thy hope, the uprightness of thy ways? Remember, I pray thee. Notice the wording. Who ever perished being what? Innocent. Or where were the righteous cut off? Even as I have seen, they that plow what? And so what? Reap the same. What you sow, we get this, we get that principle now. They got it now. By the blast of God, they perish. That's what Job just experienced. By the breath of his nostrils, they are what? Soon. What are Job's friends thinking about him? God will never do this to you if you had not sinned, Job. And a big portion of this whole book is all about these discussions that are going on. Job's friends were confused because they were looking at life and God the wrong way. They said a lot of true things. But we got to remember, in reality, who was guilty before God? Everyone. Everyone who's ever been born is guilty except Christ. Romans 3 makes it clear. We're all guilty before God. We all experience many good things from God that we do not deserve. And God is right to punish us, all of us. And He had punished none of us as fully as we deserve. Wasn't Job innocent? 
Yes, he didn't commit a great sin. A hidden sin was going on. But he's still a sinner. Jesus died for every sin. Even those little sins that we think are no big deal, they're punishable by death. We are so earthly minded. We are not really that good good many times. Our sinful minds warp our thinking. Job's friends were not speaking correctly about God. At the chapter 42, the Lord said to Eliphaz, the man that speaks right here, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends. We have not spoken to me the thing that is right as my servant Job had. God slaps him and tells him to repent, or I will bring destruction on you. And they repent for us. Folks, we're not to place hope in this life. We're not to even place hope in good things that God gives to us. Our hope has to be in our God, and we know that so well, but to live it is a different story. To live it is a different story. So when bad things happen to us personally, or bad things we hear on the news, something really bad happened down there, wherever there is, how are we to respond? We must look at God's character and trust Him by faith. We must look at God's character and trust Him by faith. I'm going to give you something I really haven't taught on. It's very deep. And I'm going to say it and I'm going to move on. When bad things happen, it's pointing us to God's ultimate judgment on sin. Picture it. Disasters, crimes, death, disease. All they do is display a portion of what hell will be like. Misery, pain, and suffering. God's going to judge sin. Hell will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's the bad, the judgment. Okay? When good things happen, it's pointing us to His goodness and kindness. So, why do we have both? Here it is, ready? Bad things show us a glimpse of the penalty of sin. We're in a sinful world, we're sinful people, right? Okay? So bad things show us a glimpse of the penalty of sin. Katrina, whatever, all that destruction, that's just a little portion of a glimpse of hell. You think that's bad? Wait till ultimate judgment happens. It's a whole lot worse. That's just a picture for us to realize and wake up. Judgment will come and it ain't going to be played by. There's no recovery from Katrina. Okay? Hell is real and it's forever and eternal. Good things are a glimpse of the splendors of glory. Relationships that we love. Right? Good times on the beach or the mountains in the way place. Right? All these things are glimpses of the glory of God. Of just enjoying what God has created. And so I never really taught on this, but these are the things that are going on and we see it. As these bad things happen, we, we have to look at it differently than through our sinful eyes. So maybe we as Christians long for a city whose builder and maker is God. Didn't that know what Abraham was doing? Yet he had all the riches, but he was looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. That's what he cared about. Maybe we long to be with God. And then this is what redirects Job. In conclusion, we see a king and a servant meeting together. In chapter 38, we'll be closing up. Job 38, God begins to speak. For four chapters, God speaks. Verse 1, page 426, chapter 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up thy ones like a man, Job. Probably the man of thee and answer without me. Job, you answer me. Give me the answers to these questions. Where was thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare it, thou understandest. In other words, tell me, please. Who has laid the measures thereof? If thou knowest, who stretched the line upon it? Whereupon the foundation thereof fastened to? Who laid the cornerstone thereof? Tell me, tell me, please. Four chapters, God asked Job question after question after question. The king of the universe, folks, does as he pleases. That disturbs us. 
we've got to make sure we really know them. Bottom line. We are a service even if we don't live like it. It doesn't matter. God's in control. Just like we saw last week through Esther, God was orchestrating all of that. Though God's name is never mentioned. It's so obvious. God is all powerful. He's over everything. He's king. Job, as God's servant, responds in chapter 42. Look at it. Verse 1. Then Job answered the Lord. Four chapters of questions. He said, I know that thou canst do everything. You can do everything. And no thought can be pulled from thee. No one can hide your thoughts from God. He knows it all. Who is he that hides counsel without, without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered, in other words, I have spoken things that I didn't understand. They were too wonderful for me. Here I beseech thee. Now he's beseeching God. I will speak and I will demand of thee and declare thou to me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of my ear, but now my eye seeth thee. Notice Job's response, say it verse 6 out loud. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent from dust and ashes. Chapters 1 and 2, Job is mourning over losing everything. Of course he would. He lost 10 children. They all died in school. Now Job hears God speak, and Job's back in what? Verse 6. Mourning again. Mourning in the beginning and mourning at the end. Now, I'm not going over how God blessed Job again. And I hope you can read that on your own. But God doesn't explain. Job didn't know what was going on in heaven between the Lord and Satan. But folks, is Job fine with not knowing now? Is Job fine with that? Yeah. He's totally fine. After hearing God speak to him, his response is, I won't say no word. I'm fine. And we who are saved will see God one day. We're not going to get to heaven and say, why did you do this? Or why did you let that happen over here? When we see God, we'll be wrapped up in all of who he is. We will fully grasp the meaning for which we were created. We were created for God's glory. We are created to worship Him fully. That's what life is to be about. We will know our God and we will not question Him at all. That's what we need to wrap ourselves into. Now I want to encourage you and put your place in the shoes of Job and read those four chapters to yourself. And read and maybe meditate on the next few days. And, and, and just may we all respond like Job and just say, I repent. You are God. You do whatever you want. I'm fine with it. We get to that place, we're going to be fine no matter what happens. That's what we need. You say, well, I'm going to fly, preacher. I know you don't fly now, but everyone goes through good part times, don't they? Mm -hmm. You need to prepare your heart for it. Because it happens to all of us. <clears throat> Mark Dever points to Christ, and I'm going to read that. God declared that Job was righteous. Jesus was perfectly righteous. Job feared God. Jesus obeyed his Father in every area. Job lost his earthly possessions. Jesus gave up his heavenly realm. Job suffered well in the situation. But Jesus planned the way he would suffer. Job did not curse God, but Jesus became a curse. He was cursed by his Father. Job had sores as a result of God permitting it. Jesus was smitten by God. Job's life was preserved. He did not die. Jesus gave up his life for many. Job had grief and agony, but Jesus knew the depth of grief and agony. I think it's very real. Last passage, turn to James chapter 5. It speaks to Job. We're going to close right on this passage. James chapter 5, speaks 894, if you have a few Bible, 894, just flip over there, and you're right there. 894. Verse, there's two verses, and we're done. Verse 10 and 11. James chapter 5, verse 10. James is seeking to encourage suffering people, Christians who suffer. He wouldn't be right with the church in America, of course, but sorry. 
Take my brother the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of what? Suffering, affliction. These prophets went through a lot, folks. They called suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, have seen the end of the Lord, which we did not read. I would encourage you to read it, but you've never read it before. But notice what it says that the Lord is what? Pitiful, tender, merciful, compassionate, and merciful. Is this how we think of the book of Job? God is merciful and compassionate. Is that how we think of God in the book of Job? Now I'm going to say something. If not, we are too man centered instead of God centered. Being man-centered is so easy. Guess what you do to be man-centered? Nothing. Just think about what you want and you're man-centered. That's so easy, isn't it? But we will not be God-centered unless we dwell upon our God. And that takes time, doesn't it? It takes time. I'm just learning of these new smell phones, and I'm just going to encourage you. Man, I was blessed yesterday at work. I got to listen to five hours of sermons while I worked. I love technology, man. I love it. And I got to go through four hours of sermons on the book of Job from Mark Devlin. Love it. It's awesome. You know? And use the phone. Use the technology. And maybe it's just listening to God's word. But folks, this technology is awesome. And I, I, we, can, we can dwell on God in so many ways today. And I'll encourage you to do it. Because you need it. I need it. We need it. That's fine. That's great. Father, we thank you. For being the God who is over all. Lord, we don't know why. All said and done. In the depths of who you are. Why you permit drastic things around us to happen. And we don't get it. But you certainly do. And you, you place the book of Job here. The very first book of the Bible. For us to look at and study, and we can take time even this week, meditate on it. Because, Lord, the bottom line is we need to trust your character, who you are. Thank you, Lord, that Job did. You gave him the grace. You give us the grace to do it. Lord, we pray that we will not wait until that drastic time that may or may not come. Lord, we will truly just rest in you like Job did before it all happened. Truly praise you and glory in you, worship you as your people in this place. We praise you and thank you for being our God, and making us your people, we who are saved. Truly, Lord, if someone doesn't know you as Savior, we pray that they will see the cross and realize they must bow, repent of their sins. If you die for their sins, they will truly trust in you. Thank you, Lord, as Job trusted in you, we thank you. Glory and praise you. All the people said.